Hello! So Lindsay Price here and um, usually I am alone in a room but look there's another face Yay. right beside me! Two of us! Two! Two for the price of one and uh, we are talking uh, new plays and specifically one new play specifically written by Matt Webster. That's me! Uh, and Matt Webster, what's the name of your play? The Perils of Modern Education. Now, who knows about that, right? If you're listening to this, I, if you're watching this, you have, uh, you can think about a gazillion perils oh, of modern education. Only every teacher ever knows about the perils of modern education. And how do you know about the perils of modern education, Matt Webster? Because I was a teacher for a long, long time, and <laughs> I watched these perils play themselves out day after day. Yes, how long were you a drama teacher? Uh, I was a drama teacher for 20 years, between being a university teacher for 14 years and a teacher at a high school for six. And um, so not only were you in the classroom, but then you also have this, uh, this side job of playwriting. I do. And how, when did you decide, because you used, you used, um, you worked on perils with your students, right? Yes, yes. Um, I had written pieces over the years uh, that worked well with students and I thought I could put the, a show together with my students and when I decided that I wanted to create a show out of some of the pieces that I made, I took some pieces that were existing, I wrote some new pieces and worked with my students on some of those pieces and uh, assembled this piece and we presented it and performed it and got good feedback from it. So, so Perils of Modern Education is a, uh, a vignette play. So we are talking about the theme, which is Perils of Modern Education, um, and that there are some scenes which are just one ofs and a couple of characters who make an appearance a couple of the times. If you're familiar with Theatre Folk Plays, you know that we, uh, uh, we really love the, the vignette play because it works so well when you've got a class and you want to put on a play with a uh, with an entire class. Um, you can also, did you do doubling when you uh, presented it? I didn't do doubling, I did it with a class and the class was relatively small, but what you were talking about with the vignettes, what was really nice with that, was that if people were not there, if people were absent, you could still pick a scene to do, you could still work with the people that you had, and it's a really easy way to put a show together. So one of the, the I think the, the hallmark scenes in this play is a drama class and they've just received um, the the standard uh, standards of performance for this class, and that the, the students have to perform to a certain standard, um, or else the teacher gets in trouble. Which which seems bizarre, but I'm guessing that comes from real life, that Mr. Was Webster. From very much real life. I sat on committees at the local and state level where they were trying to develop standardized tests for theater, if you can imagine. And the conversations they had and the conversations that I had with, with the other people who were trying to put this together, how you take something that is inherently subjective and try to make it objective. And you lose everything that makes theater theater. And I thought, how funny would it be, how absurd would it be to show what it would look like to have a standardized test in theater? And that's what that scene is. Which and so you've got things like it's so it's the Romeo and Juliet Romeo and scene, Juliet. and that so we have to have it's the balcony scene. So the balcony has to be a certain height. Must be a certain height. Must have certain railings. Must have planks that are this wide and staircases that are this deep. It has to be painted this color. And then on top of that, the performers only get so many steps per line because everything has to be standardized. Um, they have to say things in certain ways. Uh, all of it is, is laid out in structure in a rubric that they have to follow of what this scene looks like. And it just devolves with each new step that's added of what they need to do standard. Was that the gen what was the genesis? What was the origin? There's always a moment where you're like, uh, I can take this and, and theatricalize it. Well, actually, not everybody has that moment, but let's, what, where was, what was the moment that you went, this needs to be? Really, it was the, the light bulb moment of when I said, there's a scene I want to do, I want to look at what standardized testing would look like in theater and make it a performance. And once I put kind of those pieces together, take a performance and make it standard for everyone who does it, what would you have to do for that to be valid? And, and then just took it to an extreme, as all good comedy does. Mm -hmm. you, you take it to the extreme of, you, you take away any possibility of flexibility, you make it even more bizarre as it goes. And as it started rolling, it actually it came pretty easy. It yeah. came pretty easy as I was writing it down. How long did it take you to write the play? 
Um, to actually put the pieces together took me about six months. Um, but as I said at the beginning of our little conversation, some of these pieces I have been working on for years. In fact, one of the pieces, believe it or not, goes back to the 80s. And what's interesting is that the subject matter in that piece is still valid today. And that's the lunch lady scene. Oh, for, oh see, lunch lady scene. <laughs> Spoiler, oh, no, not spoiler, teaser. It's a teaser alert. You want to know what uh, what Matt is talking about that comes from the 80s, you need to get your own copy of The Perils of Modern Education, of which there is a link, I'm going to say, here or here or here. It's going to be a surprise. <laughs> um, okay, so at, what was it like giving your work to, because this is something that happens quite a bit. We hear from teachers all the time who... Um, they write for uh, a specific class or for mm -hmm. their specific students. And what's it like to sort of hand your stuff over to uh, a class and see, get their response or? There's always going to be a, a difference between what it sounds like in your head and what it looks like up on stage. And that's part of the fun. It's also interesting being a writer and director at that point because you've been wearing your writer hat and you're brilliant in your writer hat. It all sounds fantastic. And then you put it on the stage and go, who wrote this? This is awful. Your director hat goes on. It's like, fire that person. They're terrible. And, but you have the ability to conference with yourself and change things around, adjust the, the writing. And what's really nice about it is that you get to hear how things sound. You get to hear actual students, actual people performing these lines and things that made sense in your head, things that sounded good in your head. Sometimes you get on stage and go, no, that, that doesn't make sense. It made sense to me, but now that I hear it out in space, something's gotta be changed. And going back and changing it, is a whole lot easier when you're working with those students and can say, well, what sounds good to you? What would be a more natural thing to say? What do you feel like you should be saying at this point? And then take that, adapt it, and make it work. I always like to, to tell student writers that there's no such thing as silent reading in theater, right? No one goes and reads your play. Right. It has to come to life. That means you need to hear it and you need to, and, and also the words look a lot different on the page, you know, just than they do when they, um, when they come out of actors' mouths. Well, and the other side of that is the action. Um, once again, a mm -hmm. little bit of a teaser, uh, there's a character who runs throughout the play who doesn't speak. And writing the action of that character is just as complex and complicated as writing dialogue because you have to account for not only what that character is doing and moving, but how that character is reacting to the other characters on stage. And you've got to give enough information for the actor to successfully create that character mm -hmm. top to bottom. So even when you have a character that doesn't speak, you still have to account for the three-dimensionality of that character, for the thoughts of that character, for the reactions of that character. And that was a challenge that was actually a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I like those. I like those fun challenges. Yeah. Sometimes challenges... Um a little more painful, a little more um, uh, intestines through the nose kind of uh, painful when you're writing. But fun challenges are good. Okay, who's your favorite character? Oh, you know what? It, 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 probably uh, Emma, who is a, a character that kind of threads through the entire show. She's a girl who has a bit of a caffeine problem, shall we say. A little bit. A little bit. And over the course of the play, we see her popping in and out of different scenes. And we watch her progression through horrible caffeine withdrawals throughout the day. And she interacts with the student who doesn't have lines. And to me, the, the pair of them are hysterical. But I like Emma a lot because I would love to play her. I, I wrote her with amazing highs and lows. She, she will be a plum character, a plum role for an actor to play because it will give that actor the possibility to literally go from maniacal happiness and joy to fetal position curled up crying on the floor. And some of that is in the course of half a page. <laughs> high blow. <laughs> and then high again. High in the low. <laughs> it's a fun character. Okay, so um, as we wrap up here, what uh, piece of advice would you give to uh, uh, a teacher who has got your play, The Perils of Modern Education, in their hands, and they're going to uh, put it up with their students? Look for the truth, because the truth is there. Truth in comedy is what makes comedy fun. 
even though it's absurd and it's a little over the top at times, the truth exists in those characters, the truth exists in those situations, and playing the truth will just bring that absurdity out and make it even more fun for both the performers and the audience. Mm -hmm. so play it truthfully and have fun with it. I think that is a great, well, that's a great piece of advice for any comedy. It's not play the funny, right. it's play the truth. Play the truth. And we know, all of you who are watching this out there, you know the truth of the perils of modern education. <laughs> I know you know it, and uh, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Bye. Bye.